Okay, so what do we mean by the coast? The, the, the more uh, uh, term we toss around, it's in the name of our class, we, we hear it all the time. Um, what do we mean by that? Um, these, are, these are your uh, votes from uh, the other week um, about what you guys thought were the coolest things about the coast and what were the biggest challenges or biggest worries about the coast. And, I've, ranked, and I, I, I've done a little bit of sorting of them um, and grouped them. Um, and, uh, and all of these things um, play out somewhat differently depending on how we define the coast, right? So, so if we're worried, if we take number like the coolest things is biodiversity, if the coast is the immediate line where the water touches the land, that's cool. And that's going to focus our attention and our, our management uh, concerns and priority in that little area. If we have a much broader definition, we're going to have to spread our attention and our interest across a much broader area, obviously need more resources, need more, more concerns, it gets more complex, et cetera. Um, but just, just a quick review before we go on, uh, the, the big winners in terms of things that everybody seemed to like were, was the cultural aspects of the coast and the biodiversity parts of the coast. The big uh, negatives were the um, transformation of that, of that region, d development, fragmentation, loss, that kind of stuff. Um, poor management choices, which was something you guys sort of were re referencing um, a bit more generically. Uh, and then uh, issues related to sea level rise and, and stuff associated with climate change. And then everything else was a bit uh, below that. Okay, so what I want you guys to leave this lecture with are these key takeaways. Um, for the purposes of our class, we, we will generically, if, if we're measuring something or, or, or doing some type of uh, uh, estimate of biodiversity or something like that, I would give you a specific um, definition uh, that we're talking about, the one that we'll use for the coastal zone. In general, though, if we just say, you know, coastal, we're going to use this first one here, which is the, the chunk of the ocean that's directly influenced by the land and the chunk of the land that's directly influenced by the sea. So a generic definition, right? One that has fuzzy boundaries. So generally, we're using fuzzy boundaries unless we need to be more specific. And today, we'll talk about some of the examples of ways pe people get specific. Um, the shoreline that we use uh, in our, by our convention, and again, this is by convention, there's no magic um, you know, intellectual reason why we have to use this. We use the actual linear shoreline as the mean higher high water level of tides. We'll talk about what that means. So when we have to draw that, 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 that two-dimensional line, that's what we use to draw that line. And that uh, as you're getting from our readings, et cetera, there is no one definition of the coast. It's going to depend on the jurisdiction we're in, what country we are in, et cetera. And more importantly, it's going to depend on the context and the management question. We'll use slightly different definitions uh, in, in, in different settings. Um, the three main ones, though, that you should know about um, uh, generically are distance-based measures of the coastal zone, and those distance-based measures are usually from the shoreline. That's why the shoreline is important here. So a certain uh, distance inland, a certain distance out to sea. Elevation-based measures, how high or, or um, relative elevation relative, again, to mere mean higher high water. That's why it's important we talk about that. And then uh, also very commonly used are, are political uh, units that are just convenient that we use um, because that's how we already organize some of our existing data or population data or economic uh, you know, tax collection or something like that. Cool? So um, our general definition is, is generic. Uh, shoreline is important to define what that thing is. And then from the shoreline, we can use distance-based elevation or elevation-based measures uh, or uh, political boundaries. Okay. Uh, that's in defining the area. As far as conceptually, who is here, um, the demographics of the coast differ dramatically from inland areas in terms of humanity. Um, 
uh, and a couple of the key takeaways that we'll touch on, but that you should definitely know um, by the time you graduate from this class, is that the number of people that are alive right now in our coastal zone, however we want to define it, the number of people that are alive right now in the coastal zone equals, it is more than actually now. Now it's more than all of the humans that lived on Earth in the 1950s. So all of that humanity crammed into this relatively narrow band uh, of land next to the sea. Um, uh, and, and, and this definition here, I use 35 to 40, it evolves every year, but, but this general thing of about 30 to 40 percent of uh, humans live at the coast, again that's going to depend on the years, can depend on the definition we use, but about a third to 40 percent of people live there, but it's only about 10 percent of the total land mass. Right? This is all setting us up for why these management challenges are so, co are so complex. And that if we needed as a number, uh, it's more than this now, but, it's, but it's, it's more than a billion people live in the, coast, in the immediate coastal zone, okay, worldwide. And the greatest number of those are uh, concentrated in the coastal zones of Southeast Asia. Um, and then we have a legally defined area of our coastal zone that our legislature created that's now in our state constitution. So we also have a one of those important political things that we'll talk about later on in the semester. Cool? Those are our big takeaways. All right, so let's talk about that. So Gesundheit, what do we mean by the coast? So um, most of our largest concentrations of people are at the coast. You can get some inland places that have a, a large concentration, something like, say, Chicago. Um, Although one can argue that Chicago is almost like a coastal setting on a, on a big giant lake. But, but um, most of our largest cities on the planet are on the coast. Think Hong Kong, think New York, think London, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Why? So since that lake is so big that Chicago is on, right. it wouldn't be, I guess, coast is salt water. Oh, so that's good. I, I, I don't... I think, I don't remember if I touch on this in this lecture, but so um, in the per for purposes of many of our coast federal coastal management decisions, and that's like who gives you money to fight invasive species and things of that nature, we in the U.S. consider the Great Lakes or, or the edges of the Great Lakes coastal zone as well. And that was a political decision when, when the, these political structures were being set up that people wanted some buy-in from other parts of the country, and they, and they um, said, okay, so we mean the, the, the saltwater coastline as well as the coastline around big, large, around the Great Lakes, basically. And having been to the Great Lakes, so right before the pandemic, my son and I did an ice survival camp uh, in uh, Ely, Minnesota. Really cold. Um, uh, and we were, we were building um, Quincy's, these ice shelters and everything. We thought, this is what everybody did. Apparently... Almost everybody else bailed. It was like a week-long thing. Almost everybody, all the other groups bailed and ran back to camp because it was too cold. Um, so it was really cold. Uh, but in that trip, um, uh, we, we went around the edges of uh, one of the Great Lakes. It looks like the ocean, right? I'd never really spent time I ha before that trip and around the Great Lakes. If you blindfolded me, you know, kidnapped me, put, put me on the shore, took the blindfold off, I would think that I was on an oce oceanic, um, you know, the edge of an ocean. Waves look like that. I mean, horizon, horizon, the way the birds were moving, everything seemed very cold. So, so it's not just a political decision. There are reasons why. It's not like a Lake Tahoe or a Lake Casitas that we're talking about. It, it's, it's, a, it's much more akin to the, the challenges of managing an uh, oceanic uh, thing. Um, somebody else had a question? Um, Stephen. Yes. Or if it's just uh, okay, so Stephen's question is, is, is there like a universal definition? And I would say different jurisdictions have their own. And in some cases, there's multiple, there's, <clears throat> in most cases, I would say, there, it's going to depend on the question. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, tax incentives, we might use one definition. If we're going to talk about um, uh, potential, potential, um, uh, vulnerability to hurricanes. There's a different definition we'll use. So, so it's so you'll see. We'll go over, we'll go over some of those now. So, good question. Um, okay, so our biggest cities are at, at the coast. 
Um, and, the, and then the density, the number of humans per unit area, per square meter, per square mile, per square kilometer, whatever you want to pick. Um, we are also uh, at our greatest density at the coast. Um, when you take, uh, in the case of the U.S., but it works pretty much all over the place, where you take our coastal counties, the counties that touch the salt water, um, that's where we have the greatest concentration of wealth, of job creation, um, all that kind of stuff. All the, all the economic and social activity is also tracks with the total number of people and the density of people. And then uh, the specific demography, educational attainment, um, uh, uh, racial diversity, uh, uh, you know, all the different things we could slice and dice our population by, there are clear pat different patterns at the coast versus our, our generic random uh, inland uh, chunk of land or county that we might look at. Um, so I, already, so I said this before, but, but uh, more people live at the coast than were alive in all of the earth in, uh, in the 1950s. Um, and that translates into about a billion people, it's more than a billion people now, living at the coast, uh, globally speaking, with the majority of with the largest uh, chunk of those folks in Southeast Asia. Um, as far as our coastal population, right, we have our, our official censuses every 10 years. In 2010, um, we had 123.3 million people living in coastal uh, counties in, in uh, the US. And in 2020, we had about 134 million. It was a little, little more, but it was basically 134 million folks in 2020. Um, so again, uh, lots of people, lots of people. Now, I grew up in, um, as you guys know, I grew up in Northern California, and, uh, and there was always this, this rivalry, right? So this, this, it was always like, oh, SoCal, you know, like, blah, you know, NorCal versus SoCal. And the rivalry to me was very similar. So I did my PhD at UCLA, and I worked at a USC uh, research facility both as an undergrad and then as a, as a grad student. And so this seems very similar to that, like the UCLA, U, uh, USC rivalry. Um, and when we play, be playing football games, it was like, you're a bastard, or a basketball game, like you're a bastard, right? And everybody yells and all that kind of stuff, right? And puts on war paint and acts like super mature. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then the season would end, or the game would end or whatever, and, um, I'll just say one of the institutions USC. Um, would be like, you guys suck. And UCLA would be like, hey, whatever, want to get some ice cream or whatever. And so, so there, was, there was this apparent rivalry that, that's always talked about. But in reality, once you get away from the, the, the time critical thing, there really was not a, like one side is like, whatever, dude, let's get some tacos. And the other one's like, screw you, right? And so that's how I grew up. So the Southern California folks were like, Oh yeah, man, you guys are jerks or whatever when the you know Giants are playing the Dodgers or whatever. And then afterwards, SoCal's like, dude, we got our sunglasses, bra, let's go like hang, right? And Northern California's like, you're a bunch of jerks, right? Like always. And so so the as a, as a I grew up in the 70s, right? And and we had a, a, that was the first sort of big round of droughts. And so we had the first orders from the governor, save water. Everybody save water. And so I was like, okay, we're going to save when people were putting bricks in their, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, adobe bricks and stuff in their water tanks in the back of their um, toilets to save, to reduce the amount of water and people were cutting it. And so they, they'd come out with, you know, once a month, the governor would come on television and say, this is how much we've saved. And it'd be like, Marin County reduced water consumption by like 17% and, and Contra Costa County reduced water by like 15%. And it'd be like LA 2%, right? And so there was this notion of, that's where all the pretty people are, and that's where all the, the, the you know, people that um, are very uh, superficial, and they don't really care about the environment, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, 
So regardless of whether that is a, a fair characterization or not, that was absolutely the characterization. When we talk about the diversity of California or the groups of California, it has historically always been in the media, in the pop culture, Northern California, Southern California, Northern California, Southern California. That's not even close to being true. So this is the lore. The lore is that it's the North and the South, but this is the reality. And this has been the reality for a long time, and this is the reality going forward. There are different, we, we are, you know, we can put ourselves in some pretty um, consistent bins fairly easily, but those bins aren't north-south, they're inland versus coastal. And so I'm showing coastal here in blue. Um, and so uh, if we just talk about the people that could vote, right, about a third of the voters are inland and more than two-thirds are at the coast. If we, and, and this is just, some, this is just a, a thing I grabbed, but we could, we could do just about any year, just about any election, whatever. This is the pattern. So you don't even, you don't even read what, the, what these things say. Just look at the color patterns, right? So this is, this is uh, the voting results for different, um, uh, different uh, attitudes and different voting results and stuff. So what you see is there's a clear color pattern, right? Even if you don't know what the, what the colors represent, even if you don't know what the issue is, there's, on average, Color, a fairly consistent color along the coast and a different color inland. And we see that time and time and time again. Um, and we see that not only at our coast, but we see that generally uh, across most coastal zones. And so in this case, this is the number of years you have to work uh, and, and what the salary would be to afford you know, a house. And basically what we see is the coastal areas are dark purple, the inland areas are uh, green. Um, same thing, COVID vaccination rates. Where's most of the brown? Most of the brown is interior. Most of the coast is dark green, indicating on average a higher um, uh, vaccination rate at this point um, in, sept in September of 22. But, but you know, however you want to slice it. Um, uh, uh, the different testing centers and, and how, how well people are doing social distancing, all that kind of stuff. Vaccinations, hotspots. Okay, so this is... This is, what is, this is how our coastal zone has changed over time here in, um, in uh, California. So again, blue is the Southern California, uh, golden is the Northern California, right? And so, so uh, way back when, we had a lot of people in, so the, you know, the original, when the Spanish, um, colonists came and established, right? Monterey was the political headquarters of California. And then that, and that sort of bumped up around San Francisco, Monterey, that area was sort of big. Sacramento comes on. All that stuff is sort of the big part. And then later, when we start to move water, make water more available, Southern California gets more, um, uh, more um, uh, population. But this is the real story, right? So, so this, even back in the day, even back in the day when we had that north, a clearer north-south um, distribution of, of people, uh, it, there's still most people are at the coast, right? So the coast is, the, is also the longest pattern. Not only is it what, what we're doing in the future, it's been the most consistent pattern over at least um, you know, several centuries and probably thousands of years, right? Okay, so how do we define this coast? Does that make sense? Any questions about that initial idea? Okay, cool. Okay, so how do we um, uh, define the coast? Um, there's lots of different ways. So we, we, so, so we, need, we need a line, we need a clear area to define where we're heading towards or running towards. Um, again, we sometimes focus on the obvious stuff. In this case, the sort of so-called towel area of the beach, the, the flat, sandy area of the beach. Um, but you know this is this is more typically uh, what we think of when we think of the coast. And so, which part of this is you know, which part of the stuff in the picture is at 100%? In our generic definition, of course, this is all coastal. But when we start to get more detailed, how do we know? Is the top of the bluff coastal? Is the bottom of the kelp bed coastal? How are we going to define that? And so, um, so the coast is is changing, right? So so it's a dynamic area. It's it's. There's always sediment being brought in. There's waters coming in. There's storm energy coming in. Um, we're putting in bridges. We're putting in breakwaters. So, so this is a, a thing that has changed over time naturally. And then we humans have also helped it to change over time. And so, um, right, there's, there's, there's a 
varying degree of influence. So on the upper left, we're seeing dust blow off the, the terrestrial world out into the ocean. And so we can see clearly one of the reasons why I like, and we tend to use the generic definition if we don't have another reason to use something else, is because everything is influencing everything. And it becomes, for the most part, generally speaking, hard to draw um, hard and fast lines that cover everything. And so in this case, if we want to look at the pollution, say the microplastics or the air quality or the, the iron input to the coastal, to the water, right? We have to look at how much, uh, what, what the hills are uh, like around that area, which will influence the winds and things of that nature. Um, and then on the right is a, is an old, is, is a, some, some art that just represents the same coastline under different conditions, right? So um, sometimes it's easy to see, sometimes it's hard to see and vague. The coastal zone is three-dimensional, but for most purposes to, to begin to define it, we usually reduce it to a two-dimensional uh, thing, two-dimensional structure, and then we build from that two-dimensional uh, component. Um, so the shoreline is sometimes known as the coastline. Each of these things have a slightly different, different definition, but the shoreline is essentially where the water and land touch, that literal line. Um, yeah, right, okay, I already said all this stuff. And so let's talk about this delineation. So to get to the shoreline, we need to talk about the shoreline. Is So this is for us. Uh, here in California, and this is for you know much of the world, but but not all the world. So we have um, there's a couple different types of tides we can have, and if you guys have taken Dr. Patch's physical oceanography class or or will or are in it now, you'll learn more about this. But suffice it to say, um, what we can do is go and and jam a ruler right where the water touches the land, and we can take and bring our lawn chair, sit out there, sit out there all day, right? And we, we, we put our, um, jam our ruler right there where the water is at one o'clock. And then every few minutes, we go and measure it again. And what we will find is the tides go up, the ocean goes up, and the ocean goes down. And by doing that over long periods of time, we've actually been able to map this. And so the tidal pattern is going to vary with the lunar cycle, like, right? As, we're, as the Earth is spinning, as, as, um, as we are rotating around um, the sun and, and the moon. Um, and so uh, this right here is what's known as a diurnal tide. And so what makes this tide is both those factors that I just mentioned, the, the astronomical components, gravitational components, but then also the local geography. So the, how the coast is shaped, are we in the back of a bay or, or other things um, will also influence it. So that's, uh, happy to talk about that if you want, but we'll, I'll just say that. And so uh, we can have diurnal tides and we can have um, semi, excuse me, we, we can have, yeah, diurnal, diurnal, diurnal tides, which is, you know, basically one high, one low a day. Um, Semi-diurnal tides, which is uh, two highs, two lows in a typical day. And those two highs and two lows are pretty similar to each other. Or we can have what we called a mixed which is the middle here, a mixed semi-diurnal tide. And that's what we have, and that's what much of the planet has. So we, have, we both have two high tides and two low tides a day, typically. And one of those is high, one of the high tides is higher than the other in most days, and one of the lows is higher than the other in most days, okay? And so uh, that's why, and so if we do that, if we, if we were going around, we were jamming our, our ruler in the, in the sand and measuring how high the tide is, right? We're going to pick the highest of the high tide. So the highest, so in this case, we'd be picking, you know, this, this uppermost peak. And so that's the higher high tide. And then we just look over the course of the year, or in fact, many years, um, uh, to measure that and take the average of that. So the average of the highest high tide each day. Um, and and that's, why, that's how we get this so-called mean higher high water. Does that make sense? And then that's what we're going to use to define the literal line, the two-dimensional line where the water meets. Why, why didn't we use the low tide? Could have. Why didn't we use the, the lower high? We could have. It's just 
whatever. It's just somebody picked something and we had to use something and we just went with it, right? So that's what we've gone with. Um, okay, right. And so that's both going to define where we are, like how far inland we are from the coast, but then also that's going to create our zero elevation, right? To relative to so-called um, uh, MSL, mean sea level, right? That's our mean sea level for this. And then we're going to go, go up or down um, if we're underwater or up on the mountain. So that's the, so our shoreline is defined by the average mean high or high water. Cool? Okay. That's us. Okay. So now that we have that, we can talk about some other definitions. Again, for, for quantitative measurements and, and what's in, what's not. So the first category uh, is our distance-based measures. So this would be starting from the shoreline and then some particular distance out to sea and towards inland. Um, the most common of these are um, uh, a few hundred meters or a kilometer, five, ten, or a hundred kilometers, right? But, but those specifics don't matter. You can, you can tend to pick what you want. The point is that they're a distance based from mean high or high water line. These types of um, measures are usually best when we're interested in a, uh, a management question that is involving some clear pressure, some clear stressor. So think about fishing pressure, think about uh, housing stock and people can't afford housing, um, that kind of stuff. So that, that's, that's two-dimensional horizontally. Then we can do up-down, right? So now then we can try an elevation-based approach. So again, starting with that shoreline, um, th uh, these types of elevation-based um, uh, measures are best when we're talking about risk, are best when we're, tr when we're trying to figure out who's vulnerable. So the classic here would be uh, tsunamis, um, uh, hurricanes, uh, sea level, a vulnerability of infrastructure to, to just uh, climate change fueled sea level rise, all that kind of stuff. We usually use elevation based measures for that to define what we mean by the, something that's in the coastal zone. And here it'll depend on what we're talking about, but uh, usually this is on the order of, of uh, uh, predictions that are made about sea level rise. And so, and so we're talking here typically three meters, three meters to, to, to five meters is, the, is the, a common one. And so if you're in a chunk of land that is uh, lower than, uh, you know, say three meters or, or one meter, uh, uh, depending on what, what agency we're talking about, that's how they're going to define if you're in the coastal zone. Um, and then the third one is just simple. And so those first two, we usually have to do ourselves. So those first two, hey, how many, how many, uh, I don't know, how many, what's the housing stock like at the coast, right? We usually, we'll, we'll do that ourselves. The, um, the last one, we don't have to generate. Those are already generated from the existing um, geographic uh, slices that we have to work with. And so those are typically going to be something like city or county or possibly state boundaries or provinces, uh, depending on what country we're in. So that political boundary-based definition doesn't use the shoreline necessarily, although sometimes they say it has to touch the shoreline but it's not, it's not the shoreline the way we, we need it for detailed measurements like the above ones. And so this is really, really convenient because most of our um, economic, um, um, uh, cultural, um, demographic, most of that data has already been for us into political jurisdictions. So this is the easiest one to grab um, if you just need a quick answer. Um, and so it's not necessarily the best, right? Because maybe we get so if we're talking about counties, hey, Los Angeles County, let's say, right? Great. So we can get all people's demographic. But people living up in the Antelope Valley aren't going to be exposed to tsunamis, right? That kind of thing. So, so it's really convenient, but it's not always the best. Um, but it is relatively easy to get. Um, and this was also really, really big in the days before GIS became a really powerful, ubiquitous tool. So back in the day, it was extremely difficult. 
and it would have been an absolute, we would have like needed our whole class to work on it for a couple weeks to probably find some of these answers, right? If we were, if we were trying to do um, a more typical distance-based or elevation-based map, right? We have big, giant printed-up maps, and you and I would probably sit there and look and try to draw some lines on that. It was a very challenging process. So the political boundaries were, were used a lot back in the day, or the primary measure back in the day. As geospatial tools have become more ubiquitous and more powerful and more easy to use for, for less technical experts, um, the distance-based and elevation-based measures have, have grown in popularity. But, but still, I would say political boundary definitions are still the, the most common, or, 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 or data is most commonly, or um, uh, the coastal zone is most commonly defined uh, by political boundaries when we talk about uh, management challenges. Cool? Questions about that? Okay. Uh, so, Let's look at some um, uh, common uh, measures that people have used, uh, or that they're using now or have used. So one is uh, so-called low elevation coastal zone. And this is an uh, area that, is, uh, that, that touches the seawater and is less than uh, basically 30 feet, less than 10 meters in elevation. So 10 meters or less. Uh, a very, another common one is a 100 kilometer buffer. So starting with that shoreline and then going in 100 kilometers and then everybody within there, regardless of, regardless of uh, elevation in this case. This would be a distance based one. Um, you do see other things, but I, it seems to be 100 kilometers, uh, you know, in, in theory it could be one kilometer. You, you could do whatever. But I think in terms of what I just see sort of day in, day out, um, when people do do this, 100 kilometers seems to be, 150 are the most common, but I think 100 is, is fairly, uh, fairly common. When, and so I should say both these two things are global in scale. So this is the kind of stuff we were talking about when we want to look at how many humans are in the coastal zone, or where is shipping uh, or, 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 or transportation most important, you know, that kind of stuff. These are the definitions we would use. Um, if it was a study in Ventura County or something, or, or, or Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA County, we probably would not use the 100 kilometer definition. So, so this is, these are global scale uh, tools. Um, you sometimes see uh, people talking about the immediate coastal zone, and, and uh, commonly people use a 10 kilometer buffer for that. Um, uh, other definitions are, are population density. In some cases, this isn't as common, but remember I, I told you guys that, that we, are, we have a, a, the highest density of humans living at the coast. So, so you can actually map the coast by just looking at the density of humans. And so, um, so sometimes people use, use that, um, although we don't typically use that. Um, and then another one, because of the um, the nature and magnitude of the types of management options that are available and the, and the constraints um, in urban versus rural settings. Sometimes we'll use uh, the percent of the coastal population living in urban areas as a, as a proxy for um, uh, density. Um, and, it's, it's a, and, and this is particularly, this, this, this one is particularly uh, popularly used when we're talking about armoring, coastal armoring, and, and the current debate over living shorelines versus um, uh, impervious surfaces. So these are all, uh, I say common, I'm not sure if that's the right term, but these are uh, uh, often encountered, I guess you can say it that way, uh, def definitions. Okay, in the US, we most constantly use county-based uh, measures. And so you'll hear in our, in the in US, or when you're doing readings about the US, you'll hear coastal watershed counties and coastal shoreline counties. Coastal shoreline counties is exactly what it means. It, the county touches that shoreline that we've defined, right? Pretty obvious. Um, coastal watershed counties mean that a watershed that direct, I mean, obviously everything ultimately drains in the ocean, right? No matter where we start with, but, but we're talking about watersheds that are um, start and then drain directly into the um, ocean. Um, you can, you'll hear the term coastal watershed counties, and that's um, not necessarily, it's that, that's a larger group of counties than the shoreline, because whereas, um, what do we want to say, whereas something like um, Kern County uh, is not a shoreline county, 
it has some wa some watersheds that start in parts of Kern County drain to the coast. So so that would be a coastal watershed county. As I mentioned before, as you guys were asking the question about the Great Lakes, um, uh, we have uh, some coastal zones that are inland, some coastal stuff that are, touches the salty ocean. And so um, sometimes we talk about oceanic shores or oceanic um, uh, areas, but when it's the feds, unless they distinguish, they're going to be meaning oceanic plus Great Lake uh, uh, areas. And then we have uh, arbitrary definitions. So definitions that, um, why are they the way they are? Just because is the short answer. So example, uh, the best example of that is, our, is the California Coastal Commission. We're not going to talk in detail about the Coastal Commission today, uh, but we will later. But suffice it to say, um, it's why our, our legally defined coastal zone in California varies tremendously depending on where we are in the state. And 100% political decision. 100%. Okay, and then we can also talk about some arbitrary decisions for areas that we want to um, perhaps, perhaps do some sea level uh, rise planning um, in. So for example, maybe we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna talk about, uh, for, the, for purposes of this, we're gonna talk about the coastal zone as, as an area next to the shoreline that also has a high concentration of Superfund sites or something of that nature. Okay, so let's, so, so, I'm being a little flippant about these definitions, and I keep saying that we will generically, when we say the word coastal, use the, 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 the broadest definition, but the definitions do matter. And we should realize that how we measure and, and how we uh, discuss things is, is a direct consequence of how we're, uh, the assumptions we're making and the definitions that we're using. So for example, here are the shoreline counties, which you see, which you see in blue. And then the coastal watershed counties, which are um, both that blue plus the green, right? So, so if we're talking about who's going to get aid from this federal bailout money, it's sure going to matter, right? It's going to matter a lot to you whether you're blue won't matter because you're going to get some money. But actually, you might kind of care if all of a sudden you're, you're dividing it just amongst the blue folks or the blue and the green folks, right? If you're the green folks, you sure as heck want to be considered as a coastal county if there's some kind of disaster, right? That type of thing. Okay, so here's some stuff from some of your readings that I had you guys do, but um, just a few examples. Um, there's only 254 of our more than 3,000 counties in the United States um, uh, touching a shoreline. So that's 8% of the total number, or if we're talking about aerial extent, that's 16% of the total acreage of uh, of the land in the U.S., but they, as, as of 2010, they contained 29%. Uh, remember, I told you these numbers vary between like 30 and 40%, but this is just a measure from 2010. Uh, in 2010, they contained 29% of the people, half of our most populous cities, and 70% of our most populous counties. So that's where a lot of the action is happening, right? This is not to say we should ignore the rest of the country or anything. I don't mean that at all, but it's clearly where most of the the energy action attention um, is, uh, is directed. Okay, uh, we can talk about a political a definition. So as I mentioned before, the, the Coastal Commission. And so in California, this really got us going. Um, uh, the Coastal Commission starts in 1972. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not giving my history of the Coastal Commission yet, but um, for two things. There is a, an area uh, north of San Francisco called Sea Ranch that was getting developed and an area in and, and Malibu here. Those two areas freaked everybody out. They, where they got freaked out is because they saw the coast becoming super expensive. They saw the coast becoming very exclusive and people shutting down access. This is my private road. This is my private beach. This is my part, private part of the state. And so voters asked their uh, legislative representatives, hey, can you guys do something about this? And they did not. Why? Well, you can ask yourself that, but probably has something to do with the folks that live in those areas, maybe have a lot of resources, and maybe those folks, maybe you're very active, and maybe those folks give money to people, and so there was some hesitancy about ticking them off. So then the public was like, well, screw that. We're gonna use our um, ballot initiative, and we will create our own ballot initiative. It was called Prop 20. It was passed, 
And so in 1972, we created this, this, this first um, step, what we, will, what we will call the coastal zone. Um, then the legislature really got freaked out and said, oh, we can't let these people decide it. So then they, a couple years later, passed a law that modified the constitution of the state of California. And that's what we're, that's what we're using now. So that, that, what I'm going to talk about now is the thing from 1976. Um, uh, yeah, and so, and so what happened was um, uh, this started. The coastal zone, or the, the California Coast Commission has been charged with managing access and managing development to do it in, a, in an appropriate way, hopefully. Um, it manages all of the shoreline of California except for the part that's inside San Francisco Bay because there was already a, an entity called the San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission that existed before 1976, actually before 1972. Um, so, so there's, they, they don't do inside the bay. Um, but the coast, the, and then we also have the Coastal Conservancy, which is not the Coastal Commission, separate, everybody gets some confused. Actually, people have heard about the Coastal Commission They've never heard about the, most people have never heard about the Coastal Conservancy. If they have, they, they think it's the Coastal Commission, yeah. Uh, are they like partnered up with the Nature Conservancy? No, totally different than, well, I mean, they might do some collaborations with the Nature Conservancy, but this yeah. is a state agency, totally different. So this is a, this, these are all state, yeah, the, 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 the things that I'm listening here are all state entities, state organization, uh, state, state um, agencies. Um, and so the Coastal Conservancy is the thing that actually buys the land, uh, like if we're going to restore some wetland, or, or they might give a grant out to groups. So they might partner with the Nature Conservancy, but they're, or, or other groups, or other local cities and stuff, but they're not, um, they're separate. So, so okay, here we go. So here is, here's our, our state of California. Um, the uh, gray is the oceanward area from uh, that I've shown here is the oceanward area from the shoreline. The pink is the landward area from the shoreline. And so, um, so you can also the the um, gray stuff is also um, can, will be referred to as submerged lands because it's because it's the part of the ocean that there's water on top of it. Um, now, back in the day. Uh, we control, we the U.S. controlled, um, the, uh, not just we the U.S., I should say any country controlled the waters they could physically defend. And so uh, these were all dudes back then, right? They made bigger and bigger cannons because they wanted to like, kill more and more people. And so we put bigger and bigger cannons on the coast. And eventually the, the biggest cannons pretty much we could get to before World War II um, sh could shoot a, a projectile, a cannonball, a, a, a shell, um, pretty far, but only so far. Um, in 1947, the U.S. The, the, the sort of had gone back and forth, but 1947, the U.S. Supreme Court settled it and said that the federal government owns all submerged land. So once we hit that shoreline, once we go, you know, a foot into the ocean, that's federal waters. Um, then we passed the Submerged Lands Act, and, and then still up to, up to before World War II. Um, we controlled up to, th uh, up to as far as we could shoot that cannon, and then out beyond there was international waters, right? So you could see, theoretically, you could see a ship. You we could go on a cliff here and look out and see a ship, and that could be a Chinese ship, a Irish ship, a South African ship, whatever, and they would be, you know, doing their own do in, in international waters outside our jurisdiction. When I showed you guys that video, about the rum runners, that's how the rum runners did it, right? They were, during Prohibition, they are just hanging right off the coast, but like, dude, we're in international waters, right? Okay, so 47, the feds say, we own all that area. And, um, and then, uh, in, in the wake of that, um, there's another series of decisions made, and so we define the three nautical miles was basically, essentially, how far we could shoot that cannon. So we switch, and we switch, and we say that um, with the, under the Submerged Lands Act, and this happens, has to do with uh, the rise of the UN and a bunch of things, but suffice it to say, the Submerged Land Act says now the submerged lands out to three nautical miles 
the state owns. So those are also called state waters. From the three miles out to 200 is now going to become federal waters. Right? So it used to be the feds used to own the stuff really, really close in close to the or control the water right next to the land. And then once we did this huge grab of defining um, uh, our so-called exclusive economic zone, the feds focused on that and turned the nearshore waters over to the states. And that's where we've remained. So up to three miles, us, farther out, feds. Cool? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's talk about what happened in 76. So in 76, um, this was all before, this is pre-GIS, right? So this was literally printed up maps and, and people literally, sm old guys smoking cigars, staring over maps in back rooms up in Sacramento or probably in a bar in Sacramento somewhere or something, right? And so, <clears throat> so uh, uh, we defined, uh, uh, so, so with that 1976 codification of the Coastal um, Commission, we needed to have a definition. Okay, so here's the Coastal Commission. Are they gonna have jurisdiction everywhere? No, they're gonna have jurisdiction over the legally defined coastal zone, right? And so where is that going to be? And so that's, that's the context of this. And so what they decided upon is the same coastal zone we have now as far as um, the Coast Commission goes in California. And that's going to go anywhere from a tenth of a mile from the shoreline to five miles shoreline. And then three out to sea, it's all the way out, right? So out to sea, they, they have full, full bore. But on the landward side, um, it's only uh, a tenth of a mile to five miles. This is a theme we'll see return to. In the water, whatever, right? In the water, we don't live. In the water, we don't, you know, V doesn't own a, an apartment out there, right? But somebody owns an apartment on land. And so, so there's, there's a different standard often applied to stuff out in the sea versus stuff on the land because of our human habitation and our, and our human traditions and, and stuff. And so that's what we see here. Okay, so um, uh, the so now I'm gonna, the, the complex part is the terrestrial sites. That's what I want to talk about for a second. So um, where we are not in an urban area, where we're not next to a big city, most of that uh, uh, coastal zone is going to go either to the the ridge line of the coastal mountain range. If there's, if there's mountains right up against the, that part of the coast. Or if there's, there isn't, or it's, just, it's really far, it's, it's much taller, whatever. Or it'll go to five miles inland. But it's never farther than five miles. In the urban areas, they're almost all less than a half mile. And many of them are much, close, or, or, or much um, tighter in than just a half mile. So we see this rural urban divide and how it's played out. And again, this is for the Coastal Commission coastal zone. So this does not apply inside San Francisco Bay. San Francisco Bay has their own rules. Okay, and so this is what it looks like. This is what we get. So check it out. So here, where we are, here's campus. Where, where am I? Here's campus. Did I put campus on here? No. Okay, so here's campus right here, right? So here's the Santa Monica Mountains, right? Rural, not a lot of urban areas. Thick. It goes in the maximum amount. It goes all as far as we can get it to go. But then we plop down into LA and it's like a little teeny tiny sliver, right? Little teeny tiny sliver. So the businesses or the homes that are right there on the coast or right there on the shoreline. And then we go a block in and like, nope, right? So, um, so it's, it's very heterogeneous. Again, a political construct, not a, a you know, GIS based thing. Um, and I would say also all the Channel Islands are in um, uh, state, well, well, well the, the coastal zone, coastal zone, yeah. Um, and this is another way to look at it. Um, it's the same thing, but this is just the, the, the literal linear definition of the inland boundary of the coastal zone. Okay, so this was our, this was our right, this is our California our California coastline or, or California coastal zone. Other places uh, use different definitions. So for example, in Louisiana, theirs is defined currently under um, a standard that was crafted in 1980. 
under the Louisiana Coastal Management Program. And in this case, uh, it's managed by a state agency called the Department of Natural Resources. And their coastal zone extends anywhere from 16 miles, the terrestrial side of their coastal zone extends anywhere from 16 miles inland to 32 miles inland. Um, and is a huge chunk of area. And so uh, this, of our wetlands that occur at the coast, 40% of the continental U.S. wetlands are in Louisiana. So this is, a, this is not like our coastline. Our coastline, Santa Monica Mountains, up, down, ge geology, you know, steep. They're very, 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 very flat. And so um, uh, they're, you know, 32 miles inland, you're still within, you know, a few, a few you know, a few meters of uh, mean sea level, you know, kind of thing. So that's Louisiana. We can also talk about another place like North Carolina. North Carolina has some of the most sophisticated approaches to um, managing um, their coastal zone uh, outside of California in the US. And much of it is relatively recently like California. Um, so in, what they do in North Carolina, uh, their, their uh, approach has been going on since 78. Uh, and their Coastal Management Act uh, defines coastal counties. So they have 20 coastal counties that uh, are either on the outer coast or, or touch an inland embayment, a significant inland embayment um, or sound. And they have two, and their coastal zone is basically broken up into two flavors. Um, the, what we would call like the primary coastal zone or the areas of environmental concern built around landscape elements, ecosystem elements. So dunes, uh, 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 beaches, things like that. And then they have the second tier, the area that is adjacent to that area, but has a potentially strong influence on that. Either it's causing some serious problems or we need to make sure that that area stays well managed to avoid problems. And that, those are called areas uh, potentially impacting the area of environmental concern. So we have California Coastal Zone, we have Louisiana, which is more of a straight linear definition, and then we have this, this North Carolina example, which is more of a political boundary with sort of an extra fringe around the, the boundary. Um, and then, and so these are our coastal counties as the Fed considers them. These are the, the uh, excluding the Great Barrier Reef. So these are the coastal seawater uh, counties. Um, and, uh, and I was going to have you guys do this as an exercise, and I still might have you do this. But um, just for purposes of time, we're going to jump through this really quickly. So um, which coastal counties grew the most over the previous 50 years? Um, what, I would, what I normally do is ask you guys to uh, tell me the, the absolute change in numbers and then the proportional change, and we might do this uh, next week. And, this, and the data set that, I'll, that I have for you is from 1960 to 2008. And you can have a look through this, and this is, this, this is essentially the takeaway, right? This is the takeaway. So um, this is the, can you guys see this? Is it big enough? So this is the pot, this is in terms of total number of total number of folks, right? This is in 1960 and, and, and 2008. And this is the change. So LA, over this post-World War II period, um, really grew the most, right? Changed the most, the most number of, of people in terms of absolute human bodies. Um, in terms of proportional change, and, and so that's California. Let's have a look at this. It's California, LA. Texas, Orange County, basically LA. San Diego, kind of like LA. Uh, Miami, uh, Broward County, uh, Florida. Um, these are around big uh, urban areas. Santa Clara up in the Bay Area, right? Florida, right? So we're seeing a pattern there. What about the proportional change? So same idea, but here just in terms of the, the proportion. And uh, Florida, so this, is a, this, is a rural, this was then a more rural part of Florida. So Florida, Florida, uh, Alaska, Florida, 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 Alaska, Florida, Virginia, right? So, so um, it depends also if we're talking about numbers or talking about proportions, but still 
California, Florida seem to be a lot of where the action is, a lot of where, the, a lot of where people are moving to in the last 50 years, uh, driving both the number and or the proportional change. As this has happened, our coastal zone and what falls into our, if we're using just say one of those linear distance measures of the coastal zone, the coastal zone is increasingly urbanized. And so this is a, a picture from Australia, but it, it's it, uh, kind of where I was um, the, um, the other week. But th I think this is a fantastic picture to really illustrate that, right? Like the ocean right up to the sea. Um, and then there's all kinds of other examples, such as uh, in, in Southeast Asia with the developing economic prowess of China and, and Singapore and things of that. <clears throat> Lots of crazy development bringing more urbanization, not only just to the coast, but into areas where there maybe was not development before. Um, or, or in this case, like creating land where there wasn't land before. It's important to say that this urbanization has been, has been going on for a long time. So anybody know where this is? Or maybe, oh, I probably, I, I just, yeah, I just typed it on the bottom there. So, okay. Um, yeah, so this is, this is SoCal, right? This is, this is um, Southern California, and this was the norm in the early part of the 1900s on into about uh, mid, mid century. And so these are all oil derricks right on the beach or right behind the beach um, uh, extracting oil, right? And so that's a pretty intense uh, you know, transformation of the coastal zone there. Um, and so this has been going on for some time. Um, yeah, and I'll just say that, uh, that We've seen just as we saw just as we saw the number of people uh, 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 go up over time in the coastal zone. We've also seen the the amount of impervious surfaces, the amount of urbanization, similarly has gone up uh, in conjunction with that. And so we see, um, yeah, I'll just say we see that. Okay, and if we look across the planet now, so that was a little bit about, about us and, and the U.S. and stuff. Now let's look about the planet. And so this data is from 2010. I've not updated it with the 2020 numbers, but the same pattern. And so this is um, uh, people uh, that, uh, there's a, areas where there's a high concentration of people. And so um, this, is, this data is derived not from counting people, but from looking at light sources. So this is, this is using um, the number, the amount of light as a proxy for the residents, and this is what we see where humanity is is concentrated. And if we go in there and we take the, if we clip that out, and we just do the um, uh, the urban, uh, the coastal zone. In this case, this one was using a 200 kilometer buffer, and check it out. This is what we get, right? So this is, this is the density of people across the planet's coastal zone. And so that's why I said earlier that the vast majority of humans in the coastal zone are concentrated in south of where we are in the coast, Southeast Asia. And that's really, really important for a variety of reasons, right? These are economies that are rapidly developing, rapidly changing in terms of money and, and, and uh, development and things of that nature. But also in particular for the Southeast Asia, very low lying, very low lying. So incredibly vulnerable to things like what we call hurricanes, they call tsunamis. Uh, they don't call tsunamis, Jesus, I need to sleep more. Uh, what they call typhoons, right, and cyclones, same phenomenon, right? It's a, it's a tropical storm. And so these folks are, are where most of the people are in the coastal zone, the least, um, the least capable of, of, you know, doing deployments and things to try to m make it more safe and in the area where the risk is becoming greater by the day. So that's, so the Southeast Asia is a real hot spot in terms of coastal management worry because a lot of those folks are very close to the bone and they're very, very vulnerable. And so even though we think of our, co our, our California coast zone as heavily urbanized, which it is, have a look on the relative scale we're nothing compared to Southeast Asia in terms of the density of folks. Okay, and there's all kinds of other things, and I think I'll maybe just save this part uh, for, uh, we have a little more time, but we can also look at the, the economics of what's going on in these areas. Um, in terms of vulnerability, another example of why our quantity matters. So, um, 
for planning purposes, we typically talk about, in, in, the, in California now, something like 2050, 2100. You'll see those numbers batter around. Why? Because when we started this in the late 90s, early 2000s, people thought 2050 was a long ways away. And so we started some of the modeling predictions and things of that nature to pick that time. And then 2100 seems like even farther away. And it's pretty far, right? When we do these predictions about stuff, it's scary to talk, it's, it can be scary to look at some of these predictions in terms of sea level rise and things of that nature. And so it's, it's politically useful to talk about something that seems a bit far off because it gives us more time to make some adjustments, right? Um, but, but anyway, <clears throat> this is what is, this is the number of people shown with a chloroplast, so show with different coloring, um, that are uh, residing in um, uh, an area of different elevations. So I'm gonna step through this. So the first one here is the number of people that are in um, uh, one foot elevation, or li live or reside in, in land that's at one foot. Here's two feet, so not a whole lot of difference. Three feet, not a whole lot of difference. Four feet, starting a little bit of, uh, you know, of, of uh, Orange County starting to come in there. Five feet, starting to get more of the Bay Area. Six feet, um, now we're getting much of the Bay Area and pretty solid in Orange County, right? Um, so six feet sounds like a lot. It ain't. So um, we have been using, okay, wait, I'll talk about predictions later. Okay, so I'll just say that our, our predictions are very conservative. Our predictions, all of the, almost all of the IPCC's estimates of change have proved to be super, super conservative. And things are changing much faster in terms of glacial melt, in terms of sea level rise, et cetera. But this is using, all of this stuff is, is based on some of that conservative uh, estimates. Okay, so this is six feet, this is seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, which we could, we very well might get here, right? And now we're starting to see LA and San Diego come into play. 10 feet, oops, yeah, so 10 feet. So this is basically much of the bay and much of the, much of our uh, levied lands that are supplying the water to us down south and food and et cetera, that's all highly vulnerable to about a three meter uh, sea level rise. Um, cool. Yeah. Would you say three meter by what year, roughly? This analysis doesn't talk about a specific year, it just says, hey, what, what would this look like? The state of California has for a long time used for planning purposes uh, uh, a meter or a meter and a half, yeah. which is three, three, three and a half feet, right? Something like that, three, four feet. Um, and that's what our agencies must do. So if you're, a, if you're redoing your local uh, plan uh, or whatever, you have to do that. But additional guidance has come from the Coastal Commission to say that, ah, uh, actually that's almost assuredly wrong, even though that's the legal requirement. So we strongly recommend planning for at least seven to eight feet of sea level rise um, in the next you know, 30 years, basically. And so that, al that also is almost assuredly too conservative. Um, but so, so the state has to do a meter, meter and a half, Strong recommendations, you know, a little bit less than three meters, and that's probably not enough. So what you get, because of that, what you get is you get areas that are afraid or don't have money or don't want to talk about it, they'll use the one meter estimate in all their planning. And then more forward-looking uh, jurisdictions will use the, the seven to eight foot um, uh, estimate. Um, yeah. We'll talk more about that when we get to it. So this, this is more about defining things, but uh, but good. So let's hold that. Um, okay. So then, uh, our coastal, our, our global, uh, uh, UN um, population estimates um, use both. So the UN uses both in uh, uh, horizontal distance and elevational distance when they calculate some of these things. And in particular, this was first really heavily used in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. We're, it, we're, we're a generation removed from that because we, we've had a replacement thing, but that, that happened in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. 
um, which was a big effort by the UN to try to get a handle on things like sustainability and, and environmental justice and all uh, development, all this kind of stuff. And so they used, this is the first big UN thing to do this at a global scale, they used 100 kilometers as the linear distance in and 50 meter elevation to define what they call the terrestrial coastal zone. And that's how they counted how many people are there and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, and then uh, sort of the next iteration um, uh, is an ex this is just an example. Um, these guys used a 10 meter elevation and uh, 100 kilometers buffer. So this sort of is, has become fairly common for some of these UN studies to use both a elevational and distance uh, a definition for what we mean by the, the co coastal population. Okay, so just to summarize what we talked about today, um, most of our largest cities are on the coast. The greatest density of people is at the coast. Um, and that we have this, um, our so-called seaboards are the, are the areas that touch the ocean. So if you're looking for a, a one, one phrase, one term to use that distinguishes the Great Lake areas from the ocean touching areas, you could use seaboard. That, that can be helpful. We, these coastal areas have distinct demographies from areas that are more inland. Uh, and that we use shoreline is fundamental to a lot of our quantitative measures. So we need to figure out a way to define that. We've defined that as the mean higher high water line. Um, and that we, we have various definitions of the coast, right? So there is no one single definition because we do, there are all these complex things. We're talking about hurricanes. Let's talk, we might need one sort of measure. We're talking about uh, economic development. Might use a different one. So we have both distance based and elevation based and uh, then uh, the, the long tradition of using political boundary-based definitions of what the coastal zone is. We talked about a little bit, uh, very briefly, about the coastal versus inland demographics, although I didn't have you guys play with that data yet. Um, and we said that people alive now in the coastal zone equal to all the people back in the 50s. Um, and that depend, it depends on our measure and the exact data set, but it's on the order of a third to 40% of humanity is living at the coast. Even though it's only 10% of landmass, that's more than a billion people. And uh, in the U.S., that's 134 million people living in uh, a, the, the immediate coastal zone in a coastal county. Um, and then we talked briefly about our, more to come, but we talked briefly about um, our, weird, uh, our weirdness in California. We have a political definition for what qualifies as the coastal zone in terms of coastal management under the Coastal Commission. Cool?